My name is Jovi Nazarino. I am the Learning Science and Education Outreach Specialist for uh, Residential Education. Um, and today's X Talk is all about AR VR, um, particularly in teaching here at MIT, um, talking about po possibilities and approaches with Dr. John Liu. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of background um, about all of his great work that he's done. So, uh, Dr. John Liu is actually trained in engineering with a bachelor's in applied physics. Um, he completed his PhD in mechanical engineering here at MIT. Um, and his postdoc work was in MicroMasters, um, and he currently is serving a couple of, uh, oh, serving as a couple different ways here. Um, so he's a scientist in the digital learning lab. Um, he is also a lecturer in mechanical engineering, um, and he's also principal investigator of the learning engineering and practice group here at MIT. So. Um, really excited to have him here um, to help talk about how AR and VR is currently used um, in his context to address different learning challenges, um, particularly in courses such as um, 2008X Design and Manufacturing, um, 2674 and 2675 um, Micro Nano Engineering Lab, um, and 2670 Mechanical Engineering Tools. Um, and he will go into a lot more detail <laughs> on this shortly. Um, just a quick note, the format he'll present um, after his presentation, we'll have some time for a discussion and QA with um, all of you here. So um, that being said, thank you. And John, you can go ahead and take the floor. Uh, Jovi gave a wonderful uh, introduction on me already. Um, just to say that I came from engineering background and then postdoc I started pivoting to engineering education. Actually, I was just talking to John Belcher just now that I got hooked onto uh, STEM education when I TA'd for 801 and 802 for the first time. I think I was halfway through my grad program. Ended up teaching uh, at SUTD as a teaching fellow. And then afterwards, then started to move more and more into engineering education. So uh, MIT has certainly been a big part of my trajectory uh, in this work that I'm showing today. So let me just take a step back first. What is extended reality? That's a question that I often get. I'm assuming that, actually maybe even before I start today's talk, maybe I can kind of get a sense of people's familiarity with these technologies. So if, um, Maybe if you've heard about extended reality, you feel like you could define the difference between augmented and virtual reality. Could you just raise your hand? Okay, great. Um, if you have used an experience, like you've used a smartphone for augmented reality or you've been in a VR headset, like you, you've consumed this kind of experience, could you raise your hand? Um, and then if you have a played around and actually try to develop some of these experiences, whether in Unity or whether using a, a kind of like off-the-shelf software platform. Could you raise your hand? Okay, all right. So so I, I, I definitely see a, uh, a progression here and it's, it's great. Hopefully I'll be able to address um, the whole audience today and uh, if at any point something doesn't make sense if I used a piece of jargon that um, That really could require some qualification. Please just interrupt me and, and let me know So um, I'm going to less time on this then since it sounds like we're fairly familiar with this um, Augmented reality really briefly is we're overlaying digital virtual information uh, That can be seen over the real world, right? So maybe I'm in this classroom. I'm in a warehouse and I'm looking at how a uh, Particular product has more information that is now overlaid over that piece of uh, that, that product virtual reality I'm not transporting information to my current environment. I am actually transporting myself into to a new environment, right? So now I'm in a new world, or now I'm like walking on the, on the surface of the sun, or now I'm walking through the cell or something. So it's a new environment, and really we're surrounding the person, uh, both visually and perhaps other modalities as well, uh, with technological inputs. And then some people have heard of this term mixed reality. Um, maybe it's a, uh, uh, some people might say it's a marketing gimmick, but often it represents, when it's used anyway, it represents a next step beyond augmented reality where the digital information that you're seeing overlaid in your physical context that can interact with elements in the physical object. Uh, in the physical context. Uh, so maybe I can actually go ahead and pick some kind of, uh, um, like maybe there's a slider bar uh, in the actual digital context and when I press it down, push it up or down, that actually changes the RPM of a fan that's like physically in my context, right? So then you're starting to mix elements. And it's really these, all of these technologies 
uh, that would fall under what I would call this umbrella term, extended reality. So we have augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality. And I'm, I, I think, broadly speaking, our group is interested in how these kinds of technologies can be leveraged and used for learning and teaching. And so um, with that, let me take another step and go just a, a small deep dive to talk about a particular concept that's very powerful in immersive learning called presence. You might have heard of immersion. You might, might have heard of presence. Immersion often, um, there's, a, there's a debate certainly in the literature on how these terms should be used, but I think, I think maybe the most useful way of, of characterizing immersion versus uh, presence. Immersion usually is more of a technological uh, concept. It's like, how does the system, how is it used to surround the senses and the sensory inputs of the person? Whereas presence is often more of a psychological reality. It's a part of the experience of the human. If the human, and this Minsky, who I'm sure many of us are familiar with here, um, often uh, talks about it like it's as if, you know, if we were so surrounded uh, by sensory inputs, it would be as if uh, we were there or that these objects were ours. And the context here is actually in kind of teleoperation of robots at the time. And before the 80s, I, I want to say 60s or 70s, um, they were looking into how robots could be used in labs to handle very uh, volatile or very kind of dangerous chemical compounds. And the thought was, if I'm in another room, could the, could the fidelity of the system be so high that when I interact and use the robots, those hands start to, I feel, I start to feel like those hands are mine. And so that was the initial context behind uh, this, uh, this kind of word presence. So uh, maybe colloquially, you could say it's the sense of being there. And there's a broader definition if it's not just a geological location. It's this illusion of non-mediation. So um, what are the implications of that for human experience? There's a few that I want to, I want to be able to, uh, share with you, and I think you can probably think through um, these powers, like how might then we be able to use these for education. Um, the first one is transport, right? So the power of presence is that now I can bring in objects into my space, um, and I feel like or I sense that that object is here, or that I transport myself to another, transport me or a colleague into another space, right? So that's transport. Another one is the avoidance of danger, right? I might be able to walk through a nuclear reactor and still see a lot of the features or be able to look at the phenomena without ever actually endangering myself. Um, another is changing scales, right? Now I can kind of traverse across the universe or I can walk through a cell and I can think on different scales and I can experience uh, uh, different phenomena on those scales themselves that I wouldn't be able to in real life. Another is, and this is a whole uh, kind of, there's a whole body of growing literature around embodied cognition, uh, but basically it's this notion that when I, you know, when you're teaching a student, you know, or teaching yourself like you might say like oh the phone yeah, okay. now this particular metric it, it is increasing right or something often we think or we teach or we reason with our body uh, and it turns out that we often will learn with our body too it's, it's it can be considered a thinking instrument and so um, immersion allows us to engage the body in a way that perhaps in other media we might not be engaging all of the the features of our body um, another is socializing. Uh, we were, I think John and I were talking about, you know, one of the projects that he was involved with that perhaps you can transport different people in the same environment and collaborate or reason through a particular, uh, a particular uh, concept together in this new environment. So there's a, there can be a social aspect as well. It's not necessarily that just an individual is in that environment themselves. And then I would say that these uh, different powers, they might then uh, kind of, uh, kind of sum up to these superpowers that as a result, uh, immersive learning uh, might be able to offer new levels of engagement or different types of engagement if you can um, avoid danger but then also change scales or transport different objects. And uh, there's a, a power of persuasion, I think, that is uh, different in immersive learning. And so these might be meta powers, you could say, uh, for teaching and learning. And so again, you all teach in your different environments. It'd be interesting at some point to have a, that discussion, like how might we be able to use these powers to further your learning outcomes and objectives? 
Um, so with that, in my group, we use design principles and to really solve, try to solve challenges in STEM. Um, we start with the and pedagogy, we look at ed tech and we try to apply it in, in some cases into immersive technologies. And we're really looking at a broad kind of different levels of, uh, um, of the learning ecosystem, you could say, from individuals to schools and companies and really whole communities. And so um, you won't see necessarily all of this today. I'm really focusing on the immersive side, uh, but hopefully you'll, you'll see a, a couple touch points. So um, I'll be talking about a few projects that we've done. Um, not every project necessarily will, will hit your fancy, uh, but hopefully you'll kind of see you know, different projects that might raise questions that you'd be interested in. Um, and then at the end, I'll just wanna share two couple um, initiatives that I'm working on really for rollout for next year. Okay, so for the first one, this first one is really the, the AR product teardown. It's really uh, um, kind of an opportunity to show you um, how our group does things, kind of a, a look under the hood. So it's a bit of a deeper dive. Um, I probably have too many slides here, so I'll try to go, I'll try to touch lightly on some of the points and then move on, but you'll see that there's plenty of, if you have questions, there's plenty of um, opportunities to go deeper. Um, so this one is really based on the pedagogy called Disassemble, Analyze, and, as and Assemble. This, uh, to tear down a product, really is, uh, has been well accepted in the industry for a long time, engineering industry. Reverse engineering, looking at cost benefits, cost analysis, um, trying to ideate for future products. But as a pedagogy, it's really only been formal in the past 10, 15 years. And so um, this is a picture just from 2008 where we actually have students, you know, that's, I think they're taking apart a, a toy product called a CNC, you know, for like three-year-olds or four-year-olds. And then we ask them questions along the way, like what does this mean about, you know, what process was used here? And compare, like come up with a process plan for me, compare and contrast this one with another process plan. So we lead them along a set of analytical questions, but they're engaging with a particular product. The, 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 this is a wonderful pedagogy. It's something we, we believe highly in, but there are some challenges to this. The first is, you know, what if we wanted to get this kind of pedagogy to the rest of the world? Like we can't necessarily ship you know, tens of thousands of kids uh, to 150 countries. Um, the second is, you know, what if we did want uh, students to be able to take apart like a windmill turbine blade, right? Or to take apart a part of a nuclear reactor. There's, there's, we don't necessarily have access to every single object that we want them to engage with. And then the second, the, the last one is just, you know, when I'm walking around the classroom, like I might point that I might, I might use a Socratic method. My colleague might be more in favor of direct instruction and, and just tell answers. So there's an interesting question, of course, around scaffolding and like how do we make high quality uni uh, guidance uniform for all students? And so um, we felt a few years ago that augmented reality could be an interesting solution, especially for our online learners who are learning from 2008. And uh, that XR, uh, but however, in the literature, XR for STEM anyway, often still it's used for lower level cognitive skills. Primarily, if you look at the literature, we're talking about things like memorize or recall, things lower on the Bloom's uh, taxonomy. And so um, given these opportunities, I felt like, okay, could we merge you know, design, uh, DAA with augmented reality and to support learners in these higher level cognitive level skills like analyze or evaluate. And so uh, that was kind of an interesting design question for us. And we had a few questions, you know, one, do students perceive, you know, if we were to do this for students, do they perceive that learning manufacturing analysis using AR is valuable? Um, can they use this app to make meaningful conclusions in engineering? And then, you know, based on our process and feedback, you know, what principles might best assist the design of these kinds of experiences in augmented reality? So here's uh, actually just a straight, like just a, <laughs> just to jump straight to the demo. This is version two, where you're seeing someone actually disassemble a mass-produced consumer tablet, but the table's real and everything is real except any of the components of the electronics tablet itself. Like those are, even though you can see it's like very high fidelity, right? It looks real. Um, it's actually that's the augmented reality part, and so you can tell that you know and oh. And then let me go straight here. If a student wants to look further, right, and look at a particular feature, they can go into this identification mode. They can kind of bl blow it up and take a look at, oh, look, there's some kind of post-processing marks here. What that might that mean about the process plan or the tolerances when they were designing this product? And then if I'm going to pause here, um, oops, if they were... Um, if they're like, okay, I'm a novice, like I have no idea what I should be looking at. Well, that's when you kind of hit 
info box and these yellow boxes appear, that's us saying, well, if I were you or as an expert would spend more time looking at these areas, why don't you spend more time looking at them too? And if they need more hints, then you can press and hold on one of these yellow boxes and then out pops, as you can see, a textual or visual clue. And so that's our first attempt at getting, trying to get to scaffolding. So um, we kind of engaged in an iterative design process um, using classroom uh, observations, conversations with instructors. We ended up user testing with some students and we ended up implementing in an edX course, 2AA8X. This ended up, um, you know, this actual app is available on the Google Play and App Store if you're interested in playing around with it. Um, and we ended up associating it with a learning activity around, in particular, manufacturing assembly and cost. So um, a lot of, you know, over 100 student reflections. That was wonderful data for us. We ended up kind of creating a code book to analyze these learning reflections, carrying out axial and thematic analysis. So um, I, let's just jump straight to the questions. You know, one, do they perceive uh, that uh, learning manufacturing analysis using this app is, is useful? We ended up having kind of a, a fairly large portion of the learners feel like it was valuable. We had a number of quotes. These are just representative, but you know, the second one, it helps me understand each and every component, their connection with, with each other without even touching or seeing it physically. Um, or uh, for the online learner anyway, like we couldn't send kids, right? So some of them were saying like, yeah, we didn't really have any other activities. This was like a wonderful way of engaging. And, and yes, this is the MOOC learner, but you can imagine uh, this would be relevant for, you know, when we had remote instruction, um, when we had, you know, over, over the pandemic, this was a relevant thing as well. Um, question two, you know, can they make meaningful conclusions? Um, we ended up seeing a lot of comments about how the AR app allowed us to view and understand the internal features, like really looking inside uh, the device itself, internal features of the proto mold. That step-by-step -step disassembly turned out to be very helpful for them to visualize uh, what, are the, what is the assembly and the relationships between the different components. Um, and then the complexity of the product. We ended up seeing students say, yeah, this actually gives me, like, of course, I learned these concepts in lecture, but then now that I'm interacting over a real product, it gives me a, a, an appreciation for the real world. Um, and then um, I would just say for the, for the question three, this is more relevant for XR designers, uh, maybe less for practitioners and instructors. Um, but one is that in XR literature or design literature, often we emphasize more on relevance than realism. But in this case, we want students to see the complexity of products. We want them to see like this little nub that might not have been in the design, but it's just a remnant of the manufacturing process. Those are the things actually we want students to, to, to realize. So this is kind of a contrary example to regular traditional uh, design for AR. Um, but this is, this is one thing that we realized, um, you know, students saying like, oh my gosh, like these tiny details that would reveal, we used injection molding because I can see a little, a little implant, a little stamp that reveals this is an injection molding gate, for example. Um, so it certainly raises the question for designers like in this type of pedagogy, like, well, what other visual features could we offer? Like maybe we should offer x-ray scans or CT scans in, in addition, like more complex visualization. Um, a second one is like, we realized a lot of students talking about relationships, right? So how can our app actually be able to elucidate those connections even more? And so one of the things, so again, that, that's a quote that I talked about before. So can we uh, then, instead of a more scripted type assembly, one of the, which is what you see, saw in version two, can we allow students to have an open-ended exploration and disassemble it themselves? And so um, that is another question. And, and then the third one is, you know, we should be mindful towards how XR can impact attitudes. This is not something that we set out uh, to look at, but we realized there were a number of learners saying, like, oh, AR actually is used in manufacturing, the, the industry itself. And like, now that I got to use it in the classroom, this actually makes me more excited to go into the industry, for example, that I got to use some kind of cutting edge tech. So there's a relationship between future jobs and uh, the current learning experience that we weren't anticipating seeing. And so it certainly raises the question, how do we, how do we form these explicit connections even, even better? How do we steward that? Um, so, you know, we designed uh, an AR app. We developed a code book to look and analyze how learners are interacting and learning through that experience. We're demonstrating scalability and perceived effectiveness. Um, we ended up extrapolating some principles on how we design AR for this type of learning. Um, and then, you know, we're 
obviously very grateful to be funded by JWell and uh, and also MITx for this exploration. So it turns out we ended up publishing, by the way, in American Society of Engineering Education. This is like. Uh, I, I believe the largest uh, society for engineering education. At the time, it was just like, we just want to kind of share what we did to get more of these experiences that we teach here out to some of our online learners. I was surprised uh, at the time when we published that this was received so well by engineering educators, that, that apparently this is a very relevant kind of question or tackling kind of relevant questions for the engineering education community. Um, so, um, so, Plenty of things that we're interested. This is just a snapshot of the next step where we are now not doing scripted disassembly. Like you can disassemble as long as the physical object would allow you to take it apart in that way, you can do it here. Um, and then we're also interested in like, oh, you know, how many of us or people we know talked about getting into engineering or science because we were taking apart radios and computers? Something, there's something formative and something curiosity inducing about taking apart products. And, can we actually turn that around and get to a younger population, get this earlier on, and see how that impacts attitudes and motivation? So anyway, this is just, uh, you probably didn't want such a deep dive. It's, this is just an example of the kind of work that we're interested in doing in our group and how we think through the relationships between the learning sciences and pedagogy and technology. The other ones will be way shorter, I promise. <laughs> um, um, we do micro nano. So, I'm going to be really quick here. Uh, you probably have seen the CHIPS Act, right? And you know Biden uh, talking about, or many countries now vying for competitiveness around semiconductor, the semiconductor industry. So micro nano is certainly very hot these days. Um, we started working on this project a long time ago uh, before the CHIPS Act was signed. But there are some challenges in in learning micro micro nano. The the first is that a lot of the phenomenon they like. There are forces there that are dominant that are not dominant in the macro level. And so some of our intuition, physical intuition, breaks down. Right? The, the second is that you know, labs uh, might not be able to, I mean, MIT were very well resourced, but most schools, they, don't they might have one scanning electron microscope. Or they might have one atomic force microscope. Um, they don't necessarily, and then that, of course, limits how much student time you get on these equipment. Um, even when you do, you have you know, 10 students surrounding the SEM, and then one person is interacting over it. Right? And, um, and so that limits cohort sizes. So we were interested in, like, can we kind of build a suite of different digital experiences so that students can engage with micro nano in a more hands-on way, but that is scalable as well, right? And I'm just gonna show a few of them. These are not actually, and you'll, you'll be able to see, these are not all immersive learning. Some of them are computer simulation because we felt like that was actually a much better way to get to the particular learning objective. Um, what this was, uh, at the time anyway, was this is a scanning electron microscope in scale that just sits on your desk. You just put a QR code here and then it sits on your desk. And then you can kind of open it up to look inside and see how the lenses are moving, how the electron beam is shaped uh, by in, in every single stage to change the different uh, imaging modes. Um, the, like for example, the one that we were basing this off, I think had four. Um, and to see how does the electron beam actually uh, change in its trajectory or in its shape based on different modes. And the, the idea of this one particular was, you know, when you're, when you're a student and you're interacting on the SEM, you actually, the only time you actually interact with a specimen um, and the equipment is when you load. You like load the specimen uh, and then you unload. Everything else is done on the computer. And I think there's a very large disconnect between what is actually happening in the imaging and then what are students actually controlling, like working distance, magnification, contrast. And so the idea was, let's open up this black box, quote unquote, of the SEM, get students to be able to look inside, and hopefully enable them to have a deeper understanding of the working principles of the SEM, so that they're no longer relying on recipes or rules of thumb when they're using the SEM. So that was the idea behind that one. And then we have some other ones that are around the computer simulation. My point here in showing all of these, not just immersive, is, the, is just to say that, you know, um, Air VR is not, you know, the fix for everything, uh, and I don't think anyone, I hope no one leaves this room feeling that way. I, I bet you didn't come in feeling that way, and that's certainly not what, what we believe either. I think it really depends on the intersection between the technology, the opportunities and challenges of your context, and learning objectives. I think, what are you actually after as an educator? And so, in that case, we ended up down-selecting, like, oh, this one I think could make sense, the other ones, I don't, we don't really need augmented reality or virtual reality. 
Um, my last, the last project I'm going to share is um, around manufacturing skills. Uh, this is something, um, a collaboration with instructors in 2670. So this is our, essentially our intro to machining course um, that all course two, you know, mechanical engineering students have to take. Um, we did a pilot uh, in IAP this year, so January 2023. This is just a, a, a small demo of the actual experience where you first go in and uh, you, there's a safety module, of course, because we want to make sure <laughs> that uh, you're wearing the right things, right? That uh, you, you're bringing up your sleeves, you're wearing your safety goggles, and we kind of insist that every single time you go into this app, you're first here. It's as if when you go into the machine shop, like I have to double check, I have to kind of ask myself, do I have all of the different things I need to be safe, right? So it's like a, it's like a mental checklist. That's what we are experiencing here. Once you do it, then you can go into the machine shop. This is what it looks like, um, where you, it's a mix of, you have video instruction, uh, and then you here, these are what we call parallels. So you're bringing in these parallels that are kind of precision machined, uh, steel bars to, in, to ensure that your workpiece is parallel actually to the plane of the milling machine. And so you can see that you know now we're setting up, it turns out there's like 20 some steps to actually set up a milling machine uh, in order to do the, the work. You can hear sounds. We kicked out all the students from the LMP machine shop, uh, brought in a sound engineer to record a lot of the sounds. Turns out uh, sound is very important for the competent machinist, right? It can tell you like, oh, I forgot uh, coolant, or oh, my feed rate is actually too high. Um, sounds, some of the sounds are incredibly jarring to an, a novice learner, but it's the right sound. That's what you should expect. And so that was one thing that we brought in. Um, and you're just seeing some of the tasks that the student has to be able to do. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. Um, I don't know where we have it, but at some point uh, in this demo, um, the user's gonna make a mistake and you'll see a warning and you'll see the guidance. Uh, it turns out a lot of VR that's made by the industry is, doesn't allow for too many mistakes. Um, it's very scripted, it's like do this, do this, do this. But that's simply not how we learn. And so this is one of the, our biggest work was to create an environment that is open-ended enough that you can actually make mistakes along the way and you can learn from those mistakes. I'm going to skip through the rest of this demo, happy to share it um, afterwards. So um, we ended up doing a pilot in uh, January 2023. We're just, I'm just trying to sh show you that we, we did our best to kind of split class standing and prior machining. Uh, and then, you know, it's probably too much, but we, we ended up kind of assessing them on a number of different levels. Um, I would say cognitive, you know, what do you know before and after, effective, like how do you feel, are you motivated, self-efficacy before, after, um, and then also um, psychomotor. So we actually had a hands-on drilling task for them after doing the, the VR um, experience. Um, and again, all of the, like, these are well accepted, and there's another one. Um, anyway, I'm happy to share, like, our assessments to anyone who's interested as well. So a few highlights, you know, turns out on the psychomotor and cognitive side, we ended up finding that the, the cohort that engaged with VR, um, pretty much across the board on the psychomotor anyway, they ended up being more successful, whether you think about it in terms of task completion uh, or task success, um, asking questions uh, to be able to complete that task, um, time that it took for them to complete the task. Um, on the cognitive side too, we asked them a number of questions in different axes like safety or setup, component identification. Um, what was interesting though to us is that, um, and this is part of that, if, if some of you might be familiar with the NASA TLX um, survey, it looks at kind of demand and mental effort, frustration. Turns out that um, after they did the physical task, the VR students actually reported um, that the physical drilling task was more demanding, which is really interesting, uh, because they actually did better <laughs> in the psychomotor, but they reported that it was more demanding. And our hypothesis, anyway, is that in this open-ended environment in the VR, they were exposed to more task complexity. And so they have to think a lot more through, like, well, how do I actually do this thing right or not? And so then it, you have to exert more mental effort. You might experience uh, more demand on your mind. And, and uh, we also see it coming out in some of the comments where some learners are saying like, oh, I could try out things, uh, but I was still nervous <laughs> that I might forget some of the little things that I learned in the VR environment. 
And this is consistent with some of our other analysis. This, this kind of hypothesis of like learning complexity leads to more robust learning. That, that is a generally, I think, uh, acceptable uh, hypothesis. But I think it's also consistent with our timing measurements. That the VR training actually took twice as longer. Uh, it, we gave everyone 50 minutes. Traditional folks just took 25 minutes. VR folks ended up, most of them ended, ended up taking the whole time. But when it came time for the actual drilling task, they just finished it faster. So uh, this was something that we weren't expecting, but I kind of wanted to bring it up to you guys since you're educators and think about these things. So those are some of the projects that we do, um, and we're still continuing to push forward on, on these projects. Now I just want to talk about um, two really quick initiatives um, that I'm working on. There's other people working on other wonderful things as well. Um, the first one is that a group of us are working on an XR class uh, that applies design methodologies, both in hardware and software, to be able to create immersive uh, experiences. So this is collaboration, you could say broadly, between my group, you know, mechanical engineering, open learning, um, but also MIT Nano, particularly Immersion Lab. You might be familiar with Brian Anthony or Talis Rex. And so some of uh, the things that we want people to get out of it is, you know, how do you employ uh, strategies from iterative design uh, particularly, though, for designing immersive experiences, um, how do we apply uh, particularly human-centered design? Because these are people interacting in the immersive uh, environments and uh, technologies. Um, how do we carry out user testing to refine these experiences? Uh, how, what is data analysis that is relevant uh, for, these, uh, for the design of these experiences? And then really to take some, something from ideation to deployment. So this is... Uh, a course that we plan on releasing in the spring 2024 and we're really excited if you have students or if you're interested please join or if you know of students who are interested in, in immersive technologies uh, you can definitely share that with them and then the other one is there's like it seems to be there's a few spots that are popping up immersion lab and MIT nano obviously is one uh, media lab is also setting up their own space but in the mechanical engineering as well, and particularly uh, my group is setting up a space in, in Building 35 for uh, immersive experiences. And so we won a grant from the Massachusetts Technology of Collaborative, uh, and then also the Department of Mechanical Engineering is also supporting it. Um, these, it has not been designed yet, so these are just kind of representative pictures of, of what it might look like, but we want this to be a resource for the community, for teachers to be able to try things out, uh, for companies to come in and see what use cases make sense for their business, for students to come and see, you know, is this, is this something that they want to engage with in their career as well. So this, uh, kind of in active conversations with facilities, we're not exactly sure when it's going to come in, but, you know, hopefully summer of next year we'll have something to be able to offer the community. So I certainly welcome you all and uh, your interested colleagues and students to come and check us out. So with that, thanks for coming, and I'm happy to take any questions. So one, one thing I'm curious about, um, given the research and, and work that you've been sharing so far, um, are there any major lessons learned that you think might help faculty instructors, anyone who is trying currently or thinking about implementing some kind of XR technology in their course? Like what, what, what can you share that might be helpful to, to others? Yeah, so uh, I, I could probably uh, scattered some of our lessons throughout today's talk as well. Um, one of the ones I would just reiterate is um, do look at the intersection between, uh, you know, some of it is learning more about the technology. How does that end up intersecting with your learning outcomes and the resources or environment that you can, that you can provide students, right? I think it's really at that intersection that you're going to find use cases that are relevant for you. And I know that's very abstract, uh, but happy to, hopefully you saw some of that here today as well. Uh, but that's a conversation I think that I'm happy to have with you. I'm sure other people are happy to have too. Um, another one was just that, uh, you know, XR isn't like a, a solve all for everything. Um, I think it's a tool uh, that you can add to your toolkit as an educator or as an instructional designer uh, or as faculty uh, that might help students engage further, right? So if you think about like what we don't want is people to just use XR to replicate an experience that you're already getting in the classroom. Usually it tends to be worse. Um, what you want to think about is like, are there experiences, is there a visualization, is there uh, some kind of reaction that you can't get right now uh, from students that you could through these, um, through these types of technologies. And I would just go back to uh, one of my first slides, which is the power of presence, right? So like, 
how can how can you transport students, right? And do you want students to interact uh, on a different scale, to think on a different scale? Do you want them to you know, interact, uh, learn or experience something that would normally be dangerous to experience, right? Some of those, if you think through the powers of presence uh, and, think through, and then think through your learning objectives, I think that might be a good start uh, for you to know how, how you might want to engage with these things. Um, I, I think one of the things that um, you know you can think through is um, what are the um, um, I, I think one of the one of the things is are there concepts that are contextualized within the environment that would be easier to engage if you were actually present in the environment as opposed to seeing it on a textbook or in a video right so um, this is why I think exploration is such a powerful concept in immersive environments. Or maybe you can discover particular, I mean, it's one thing to just like be in the environment and like someone points you to it and I just see that then the same information I would were to see in the video, right? But could you guide students or could students be able to discover or explore the environment and then come to those lessons that you want them to? I think that would be a very compelling way that you could not, or it'd be harder I think to do in a traditional format, right? Um, so if, if you're on the, the level of, uh, of the concept, um, I, I would say even this is something that we had to wrestle with for the AR product teardown as well, right? That like we want students able to notice um, like the injection molding gate, right? That's just like there's a little nub uh, on, the, on the surface. And how do, we, how do we do that? I mean, we could do that similar to, uh, we could just tell them like, look at this. Um, or we could get them to in a, engage them in a process of disassembling and uh, trying to find something or attach meaning to a particular um, observation, right? I think that if you start to go in that direction, I think you'll have, you'll be able to capitalize more on the level, uh, on, on the, the powers of, of presence. Thank you. Yeah. Kind of going off of what you just shared, it, it, it reminded me of one other thing you mentioned earlier um, in your presentation. And um, how in some ways, you know, the, the hints that we're given to the students are in a way it's, it's, it's an expert kind of guiding a novice to look at it as if, you know, learn to uh, approach this object or process or whatever it may be the way an expert would, which as a novice you wouldn't see for yourself necessarily. So I, I'm, I'm curious and, um, you know, does, that seems potentially connected to the question of even perceptual understanding, right? How does an expert look at this versus someone who <coughs> is still learning? And is there a way that this technology maybe supports that? So, uh, you know, me having not yeah. the content yeah. knowledge here, I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, you're, maybe you can expand a little bit more on that, on that idea, I think it's an important one. Yeah, and, and I would say uh, that like the process of this kind of um, thinking or, or learning is like you have to first be able to make observations about the product, but I think you could translate to, to your environment very quickly. You have to ma be able to notice features first, right? Like notice to, to, to see, oh, there is something here that maybe wasn't here before. Then you have to be able to attach meaning to that feature, right? Like, oh, actually, that's not a relevant feature. Like that was just like an oil smudge. Like that's not a thing. It's like, oh, no, no, this, this could be something related to the manufacturing process, right? Um, uh, so, so you have to notice features, you have to figure out which ones are relevant, then you have to attach meaning to it, and then you use it for analysis. Right? Like, what does that mean, therefore, about how this product was designed or how it could be designed better? Um, and, and again, I'm using my context, but I, you know, maybe you could use it as a scaffold and, and kind of giving them information relevant to them in, in that moment. Right? So not necessarily kind of a brain dump right in the beginning. Uh, I think that was, that's, that's the kind of scaffolding side of things as well. I, you've kind of captured my aspiration for our next steps. I don't, I don't know if I got to show all of them. Um, and this is actually one of the responses I want to give to Jovi, but we didn't get there. Um, now that we've created these platforms, I mean, it's kind of an analogous thought to like, oh, we made a MOOC. And we have like all this access to data. What are we going to do with it? Well, we could try to figure out how are people learning well and not learning well, and then bring it back into the design, right? And I think, I think with immersive experiences, you have that to like, un like if there was a two D, now we have like three D amounts of data, 
right? Because every interaction, uh, there is a whole set of uh, uh, research now in gaze for VR. Like, it, how in general am I looking? It's not just eye tracking. It's just like, what are the areas that I am paying attention to? It's not just like, what am I looking at? Because I can look at this, but actually pay attention over here. Um, there, there's a lot of access now to biometric or psychological data that we can leverage. And even in the AR product teardown project, we're not there yet. So perhaps if you ask me in next year, we'll have more interesting things to say. But now we have a platform essentially for investigating how do we could, how do novices approach disassembly differently than experts, right? Are there patterns that we can elucidate between the two populations, and then let's bring that back into the scaffold. Like right now, we have a very um, kind of um, crude uh, scaffolding, you could say, based on kind of our own best guesses. But now that we know how an expert actually, what they were paying attention to and how they disassembled, can they, we then bring it back into the experience of the app so that novices then can pattern off of that kind of disassembly. So yeah, so absolutely, we're very interested in that. Uh, to get to version two, we probably spent, um, wow, that's a really good question. Hundreds, hundreds, I would say. Uh, did it cross a thousand? I'd have to go back and take a look, uh, but certainly hundreds. Um, and here's an example where we are coding from scratch, right, in the Unity game engine environment. Um, so everything that we're building is kind of from the code level. Um, and then how many hours are students spending on it? Um, Currently, uh, that in, uh, that particular assignment probably takes an hour or half an hour. Um, we are using that particular app, or we, we have been using it for like other units as well. And my goal would be, of course, that maybe every unit you're disassembling something else, and then we lead you along another set. So like once we've created the structure, we can build it out more easily. Because we've already created the application to do it for another product um, it depends on, of course, the whole conversation around scaffolding, but if it's on the same level as this, uh, 100, 50, yeah, uh, probably an order of magnitude less. You might be putting in those hours and doing other prep as you're preparing to teach or addressing recurring student issues. So in some ways I see it as the upfront, trying to get in front of some of the challenges that you know and see and hopefully that pays off in sort of long-term return. Um, yeah, gas. no, absolutely. Um, but uh, also, you know, the, the, the gas turbine, like, you might not be able to give that experience. It might be a new one. You might be comparing to, like, just not available to available. Um, or it could be, as you mentioned, a, a better experience versus a, a regular experience. Yeah. And I think, you know, in, in, in your case, um, you know, you're sort of developing it almost, like, from scratch, right? Like. There are some, depending on what it is you're trying to do, there may be other existing tools oh, yeah. that are out there, and um, John could probably um, talk a lot more about this than we have time for, but there may be other things you might leverage to not have to do things all always from scratch. Yeah, I think I, I recently had a conversation with, um, oh, actually with Brian Anthony about how do we bring this into the class for next uh, next spring that, yeah, like we could use, of course, um, better design methodologies for XR, but how can XR just enable better product design? Like how can maybe the virtual enable better hardware? And so that is definitely something that we're looking into. I, I, I would be honest, most of my work is still on how do we get people to learn and think more deeply, uh, but I'm happy to connect and share literature around that. I think one of the things that people are really excited about is like, is XR like the new CAD? I don't know if it's like that far, but but as you can, and I will, I have some slides as well about how you can already get engaged with XR. A lot of the CAD, the current well-accepted commercial CAD, many of them already have a plugin for XR. Um, uh, Auto uh, Fusion 360 has one, PTC with Onshape and their Vuforia uh, suite has it as well. And so this is something that the industry is already starting to play around with. I, I don't know if there's um, any like super like fantastic success use case at this point but this is something that people are playing around with and if I if I may let me just flash this really quick because um, I was anticipating I don't know if I don't know if you were gonna the, our third person was gonna ask this question but I was anticipating like maybe you're an instructor and you want to 
play around with these things. I'm just gonna. F I'm sure we're gonna share some slides later, um, but there's ways to play around with like well accepted commercial AR apps as well, like Pokemon Go or IKEA, just to get more used to the technology. Um, this one is like New York Times has a whole suite of augmented reality experiences you can use to engage with news stories. I actually used this one in particular for for my teaching. Um, and then VR as well, like you can purchase a $9 Google Cardboard and then there's like a ton of different like lists of um, videos on YouTube that you can use the Google Cardboard and your smartphone. It's very, very kind of low bar, easy access into VR and you can kind of basically 360, right? You can look at experience a roller coaster, do a factory tour. I think these are like if you're interested in like not spending too much time but bringing this into your teaching, these are really easy ways to do it. Um, and then like if you actually want to make things, I talked about like CAD, uh, like if you already do CAD or you have people comfortable with CAD, it's just another step, right? Like the, it's a plugin. Um, and then there's other ones like Snapchat, like you can use templates that they have to create augmented reality experiences, like to like put on a funky hat or to outfit yourself with something new. Um, oops, I'm not showing it here. Or um, there's ones like if you just want to bring in a CAD model and like plunk it onto your living room or on a desk, like PTC Vuforia can do that as well. You just you need a CAD model and you need to bring in the software, but it's it's a ready kind of off the shelf software. Uh, and then VR as well, like you can get a 360 degree camera for about four hundred five hundred dollars. Uh, and and then just you can directly upload those degree videos. I mean that is that is the base level VR, right? Where you're you're not necessarily interacting with the environment, but that is one easy way I think to to start engaging with these kinds of technologies. Anyway, I know that wasn't exactly your question, but I I thought that this would could be useful for some of you, so I wanted to flash this up too. Uh, I might point you first to the work of Fox Harrell uh, if you're talking about at MIT. Uh, Fox Harrell, who is connected to open learning, he's a professor at CCL. He's actually very interested in the social impact um, of immersive technologies. Um, so he'll do some research, for example, in placing people in these environments and um, allowing them to experience, for example, what is it like to be uh, a black person in America or to bring them back into history to put someone in their shoes. And then they'll, he'll measure, like if we're talking about assessments, he'll, he'll try to measure things like implicit bias or uh, other, I would say, more, more social aspects of the engagement. And so that's one, that's not exactly what you're saying, you know, six people around like a next level Zoom. Uh, but absolutely, I think there are some very, very interesting opportunities for research around the social or, or social aspects of humans and, and learning and also interaction. So it, again, back to the presence, like there's that engage and there's that persuade, I would say, that I think we have a lot of opportunities to, to work with. Thank you all for coming. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you for having me.